Paul. According to these show notes, you're back in Valheim. How's that going? Uh, it's just pretty good. They released a patch, like, several months ago, I think, back in January, maybe. Um, or, or earlier, even, that's got, like, new ice caves. But in order to get to the ice caves, you have to go to the mountains, like the snow mountains. But you can't just go to snow mountains you've been to before, because those have already been populated. You have to go to ones that you haven't explored, uh, which means that I have to go, like, way off somewhere to find new mountains. So, um... I did eventually find one of the one of ice caves, and it's, it's pretty cool. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, werewolves or whatever. Um, I I have these... It's a weird experience playing, like, to the end game and then going back and, like, seeing new content added at lower tiers because it's like, well, it's not super challenging for me because I've got all the end game gear. But it is cool, like, that they put the stuff in and that you can make new items and stuff. So, I don't know. It's, it, I, it's certainly not the intended experience, I guess is what I'm saying. Ice caves, though. That does sound cool. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back at some point. Uh, well, I just... I, so I went to one mountain, and then I sailed across the ocean to another set of mountains, and I haven't actually scaled them yet, but uh, I think there might be, like, pickaxe kind of stuff you can do in there, too, but I haven't, I haven't tried yet, so who knows. Are you still playing with your family, or is it just you're soloing it now? Yeah, they've mostly moved on to... Um, they played... Uh, Deep Rock Galactic together, and and then still Minecraft occasionally. So uh, this time it was just by myself. Although my youngest who plays games, uh, he's like five now, came up. He's like, "Can I play with you?" I was like, "Did you do your chores today?" He's like, "No." So <laughs> poor little guy. Yeah, but you've been playing all the latest games this week. What what have you been up to? Yeah, so I, I mean, we've been trying to do this now for a few weeks, is like, check out the new No Man's Sky update. So what do I think of the latest update? Well, um, spoiler, I am not impressed. <laughs> um, I really looked at the options, you know, figuring, oh, a lot of my old concerns have probably been addressed in the... I forget, it's been like a year and a half since the last time I checked out the game. Certainly, my major gripes will at least have evolved into new ones, right? I, one would hope. So I opened up, and, and sure enough, there's, you know, there's the menu option that's like, hey, do you want to hold down E to do things for a full second before the interface responds to you? And obviously, I'm like, you know, turn that bullshit off. I like things to happen when I push the button, not at some time later, after I've been holding right. the button for a while. Because um, I like to feel like I'm playing a video game and not pausing a VCR in 1995. And um, so I turn off that feature, start a new game, and then, you know, it fades into pure white. Hold E to begin. <laughs> But all right, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. So then sure. I get going. I, I get going. And no, no, it's just, I don't know what that feature is even for. Like, why would you put in a feature that makes you have to hold a button for a non-destructive action? I mean, it's a non-destructive action like look inside of a refinery. The Minecraft equivalent would be like, look at your furnace and see what's inside of it. That's a non-destructive action. You flip that open, glance at the contents, close it again. You do it all the time. Totally harmless. Right. If I accidentally click on it, no harm done. It's not like I'm consuming resources. Unless it takes a really long time to open it up, right? <laughs> right, right. And for whatever reason, you have to hold down the E button to open that, even though it's not a destructive action. So why would you make it do that? But then, okay, you realize it's not a good thing because then you add an option to turn that off. But then that option doesn't work. And it's just... It doesn't you have do to anything. Hold... No, hang on. Do did anything. you hold the E button when you turned it off? Like, did you hold down turn off or did you just <laughs> click turn off? <laughs> well, it was a radio button, so it does seem to... Or no, it was a... I forget what it looked like. Maybe it was a check mark. <laughs> I can't remember. Sure. But it did change state. I actually worried about that. I was like, is there an accept <laughs> button that I missed somewhere or whatever? But no, it, it seems to think that I'm not doing hold E. And yet everything requires me to hold E except, I think, getting in your ship is instantaneous. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Do they still require you to get into your ship and then out of your ship and then back in your ship to save your game? Yes, as far as I can tell. <laughs> okay. So it makes makes saving your game slightly faster. You still have to wait for the animation, though, probably. Right. And I don't mind. The animation's pretty quick, and it's it's fine. It's totally fine. I don't mind the animation at all. Um, Here's another funny thing. Uh, if you... One of the things you can do in your refinery is... Okay... I've complained in the past that there's inventory pressure in this game. It just fills your inventory with heaps of bullshit. So, like, you walk up to some broken piece of equipment, and in order to interact with it, like, the controls are covered with this goo. Maybe you remember that from when you play the game. Yeah, some sort of you... nano phlegm or whatever. Right, nano phlegm. Let's call it nano phlegm. I like that. It's not what it's called, but that's totally fine. We'll call it that. It's, it's nano phlegm. And you can't just, like, throw it on the ground. You must put it in your inventory, and then to, if you don't want it, then you open up your inventory and then drop it. And, you know, it just vanishes from the <sighs> universe then. And so it's like, like well, why couldn't I just vanish it from right here? Right. Valheim has inventory pressure. Your inventory is very limited, and you're limited by weight. But if you can't pick something up, it just falls on the ground. And it just sits there, and it's like, that's fine. I, right. I don't want those dwarf eyes or whatever. Right, but this is, you must take this object into your inventory, which means to open a container and see what's inside this, or open up this piece of technology, you must have a free inventory slot. So <sighs> then you run around, you're doing bullshit, and you're, you've got nano phlegm, right? You stick it in the refinery, and your nano phlegm can turn into super nano phlegm. You know, five mm. units of nano phlegm turns into one unit of super nano phlegm. And then you can take five units of super nano phlegm and turn it into refined nano phlegm. And then you can take five units of that and turn it into nanites. Hmm. No, no, no. There's three tiers before you get to nanites. So... Okay. You, you did... I'm, are there three refinements? Yes. Yeah, there were three refinements. Uh. And you'll notice that the five to one ratio means... The odds are you're always going to have a couple units of each of them left over. Cluttering uh -huh. up your inventory. I'm going to have one unit uh, of nano oh no. phlegm and two units of super nano phlegm and one unit of ultra fungus or whatever it's called. But then you finally run through this entire bullshit and he makes a few nanites. Nanites are like one of the meta currencies. Nanites take no inventory space. They have their own, like, oh, place on the high, right? Cool. Sure, it's like the gold counter in the top corner or whatever. Exactly, but you still need a free inventory slot to pick up the in nanites, even though they don't go in an <laughs> inventory slot. Yeah, I wouldn't let me take the nanites out of the machine because I had a full inventory. And I, like, had oh, to no. uh, close this thing, open up the inventory, free up a slot, then hold down the button to open the interface again, then pick up my nanites. But then, of course, you know, they just vanish into that mystery slot that they go in. So it didn't actually take the slot that it required me to clear. And I'm like, why? Why? It's, what are we? We are um, six years past release now? And you're still, like, terrible, like, just mean, nonsensical UI decisions. Wow. And um, here's another gripe I have. It feels like this is an open-world game played, created by somebody who never, ever played an open-world game and just had them described to him, right? <laughs> by a focus like group. Right. It just, everything is weird and off and like almost surreal design decisions that make no sense in an open world game like minecraft what happens you start a new game you begin gathering resources and you begin exploring after you've been exploring for a while you'll probably find some place that you like you'll be like oh you know what i like this hill this is pretty or this is near useful resources or it's near a village or whatever you're into right i like sure. this location so yeah, same I'm, thing with valheim it's like okay I've, you know i'm chopped down some trees my inventory is getting a little full and i'm wandering around and there's a ruined hut and it's like okay i could set up in this ruined hut that'd be fun right you explore you gather then explore 
and then sort of once you're familiar with the area you choose a place to live in skyrim it's kind of similar you start off the game you get some resources you get some gear you get rolling as a character you get some money and then you start feeling like you want to do some crafting and maybe you've got a couple of rare items and you want to stash them somewhere and you start thinking I would like a house to live in. By this time, you've visited a couple of major cities and you know, you know, where you want to live. Yeah. Whereas in No Man's Sky... Right. Right. In order to get your hyperdrive and begin accessing the enormous universe that it has made for you, you must build a base. The first step of your journey into the infinite is to stop and build a wooden shack. You don't... <laughs> need it yet you have no reason and you probably don't want one in this system this isn't you know the starting system isn't a great place to have a base so you have to build a stupid pointless base that you don't want and this is a multi-step process this is over an hour building a dumb shack and like oh now you need one of these and now you'll need a terminal and now you'll need to now you need to go find buried technology somewhere so that you can research new parts for your base and it's like but i <laughs> don't want to be building this base you know i want to explore and then soon one of these days i'll come upon an awesome planet and i'll be like yes this gorgeous planet this is where i want to live um but no so it's like i have to live on this dumb ugly brown super hilly planet with heat storms that has no valuable resources on it and i'm like what <laughs> what Why? can you make multiple bases though or is this like your base now uh you can make multiple yeah you can put bases all over the place now oh, okay that's that's at least something i guess so this took a while this took most of my game playing time today and i was really tired of it because i <sighs> It takes a while to just gather up all these resources, but I've done all this before, and I haven't seen any of the new content yet. And I'm finally, like, I'm nearly there. I'm almost to where I can build my hyperdrive. I just need to get some money. I need to run around, gather up some resources to get some money, to buy some circuit boards, to whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> sure. And then the game starts locking up on me. What? Yeah, just... Uh, I can play for about five minutes and then it locks up. So oh, no. I don't know what that's all about. So yeah, I put a few hours into this new game and now it's just sort of trapped. And I don't know if it's the, like, if I keep at it and just save often, could I get out of here? And maybe it's just a problem with this system that's crashing me or the planet I'm on, you know, and maybe if I escape it, I'll be all right. Or maybe this game is doomed or... Maybe this is a problem. I don't know. But I'm just... <sighs> we need another one of these. Because this game is so terrible. <laughs> yeah, another procedural generation open world spaceship game, you mean? Right. Because I love the idea. I love everything about the idea of No Man's Sky. And the execution is so awful. Awful. Every it's, every design It's not even that the terrible. execution is bad though, because like the yes, the execution is bad, but also the the thing that it seems like they were trying to make is also ill founded. Like it was it's yes. ill conceived and ill executed. Right. Yes. Like the the your fundamental decision about what this gameplay loop is about and how it would work, and the things that you did, like the whole premise of the game is just bad just not fun mm. and so that was um well, another disappointment i mean this is you know and i just sat there thinking I, why hasn't anybody else made a proc gen universe game no man's sky sold really well it was a huge hit why haven't we gotten copycats yeah well same thing with minecraft right like nobody's really tried to take on minecraft either not really not really it's true nobody really i mean there are a bunch of low quality block world games that popped up around 2012 and they were all awful and nobody cares about any of them and they just sort of vanished but nobody just like 
is try to take this idea and evolve it and perfect it or take it in a new direction. And we need, uh, we need, what was it? I saw you YouTube video call it. Yes. Woman's land. <laughs> Instead of no. <laughs> That's what we yes, need. Yes. Woman C maybe. Right. You know, we, we, we need somebody else to take a swing at this because I, I'm not even upset about like the broken promises at launch. As far as I'm concerned, like, I think the team has made good and they, you know, fixed up the game and added stuff that they promised would be in there. My problem isn't their broken promises with the launch. Like, I don't think they owe us anything. I just think they're bad game designers. Yeah, it's, it's sad. I mean, the, the technical achievement of the engine is impressive depending on how many people worked on it and how much effort went into it. This is one of those things where like, right. you know, we had a team of a hundred guys and it took us like six years. It's like, okay, well, like what you achieved isn't that impressive really, you know, with, with right. that amount of resources. But if it was like a team of, you know, core team of like three guys, you know, and, and they built the basic engine in a year, then it's like, wow, that's like, that's incredible. It's amazing. You can almost forgive that the, the game that they built on top of the engine is like kind of dumb <laughs> right it's kind of like weirdly designed and makes no sense and it was like when i see pictures of the development team I mean, the team has expanded since the game launched because they're flush with cash now but at the time you know during development i think it was like five people like all the team pictures I saw uh, right. of the team yeah. at the time was around five. There might have been a few more like remotely or, you know, somebody in charge of biz or marketing or whatever. But I, the core team, I think, was five people. And so what they did with five people, pretty impressive. But it's a shame that none of those five people knew how to make an open world game. Yeah, it's like the programmer art equivalent of game design. Yeah, that is it. Like, oh, uh, we don't know how to do... Oh, we'll just fill it in with generic gameplay goes here. Right. Or whoever was designing it was just playing Destiny, you know, all day. And it's like, okay, well, Destiny's got guns and hold buttons and the interface slews around when you move your cursor. So we'll just do those things. Right. But then for the gameplay, it's bar filling. So they were flipping back and forth between Destiny and a mobile game. <laughs> Right. Playing Destiny on their phone. At least there aren't any Connect 3 elements. <laughs> it breaks my heart because it's such an amazing technological achievement. It's like, what if Doom, what if John Carmack made the Doom engine, but instead of you fighting demons on Mars, you just went through a giant maze and every time you went down a wrong hallway, it made loud farting noises. Like, <laughs> it's this incredible, yeah. incredible technological achievement just used for this horrible end. Man, I, I wonder if they're, like, working on making the engine its own thing so that they can sell it to other people. Like, that would be, oh, that would be something, yeah. right? If, like, No Man's Sky is just, like, the pilot game, but really they're working on the engine in the background or something. I mean, that'd be kind of cool. Right. I don't know if they're doing that or not. All the time I spend uh, playing No Man's Sky and, like, fantasizing about all the ways I would try to build an engine like this. Oh, you could do this, and you could do this, and, you know, generating the terrain, I've done that. It, it, it's it's mm -hmm. one of these deceptively easy things, like, oh, the terrain, I could do that. I could bang that out in an afternoon. I could generate you all the alien terrains you want, different textures, and put trees on it. I've done that project four different times. And then every time I'm thinking about it, I, I get to the part where, but you have to land on a sphere and have it you know, be a coherent planet. <laughs> like, oh, I don't want to have to solve a square grid of points onto a sphere. Oh, uh, yeah. Or how could I fake it? Like, that. that's my thats my thing. How, how could I cheat it <laughs> and not have to, like, actually do some horrible spherical system so that, you know, you can just have nice, neat 2D grids? Because that's so much easier like for me that's the really impressive thing that no man's sky does although 
No Man's Sky barely pulls it off. I mean, when you're approaching a planet, what you see on the way in bears only the barely resembles what you see when you land. You will aim at a great big ocean, and then you'll get halfway there, and you'll see there's small islands, and then you'll get even closer, and it's just a giant mass of... It's just a giant land mass with no water in sight. <laughs> and it's like, right. uh, okay, it's all the right color, but... Uh, mm, it doesn't quite... It, you promised me something from orbit that you didn't quite deliver on. Right, and I wonder if they're just not even trying to... Do, and I guess... I mean, if that if that's all yeah, you're like do, layers of clouds you go through, right? Where like you go through the right. orbital cloud layer or whatever, and then there's like a second layer lower down. Right. That's sort of like it's like curtains in your face, like oh, it's the the flourish as the magician does the trick, <laughs> um, and yeah. pulls out the completely unreal. So, but and that's every one time of the amazing things about Dwarf Fortress, right? Is like there's this huge colossal world map but like every element of it corresponds exactly to the zoomed in element and and then there's like right. another level of zoom on top of that where it's just like wow and it, everything actually meshes together you could walk seamlessly across the whole thing it's uh, yeah it's really cool and it seems like they could have done that right like if they've got a noise function for a height map it seems like what they're doing is just like a, a noise function height map right yeah i would assume so it, you could yeah, sample that as a texture and now you've got a oh, texture to look at yeah. from orbit, like done. <laughs> right, and <laughs> it know. would be fun. It would be absolutely fine, except when you get up near the poles and you've got to solve that. You've got a square texture that you're mashing onto this sphere, and you know it's the classic projection problem. Um, because yeah, planets, you can do it. You can do a spherized cube though. I mean, there uh, there are ways around it, or icosahedral mapping. I mean, oh, computers are great at math. Cube, that didn't even occur to me. Oh man. Uh oh. I want to try that. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty so, scary. Um, speaking of games that are are open world, hey, we've talked about two open world games. There's another open world game that everybody's playing this week. How how many hours have you played Elden Ring? Oh wow, well, I have put in zero. Oh, well, I mean, maybe that's why you don't like Soulsborne games. Just, you've never given them a shot. <laughs> the, I was just watching a video from Bellular News, um, and it was a, yet another, oh my goodness, the, the conversations around Soulsborne games always lands in some ditch where it's like, People ask for a feature, <laughs> and everybody tells them, shut up, you're not allowed to ever ask for anything. You can't criticize these games, they are always perfect. If if this isn't what you wanted, then why did you buy it? Apparently, there's a lot of quests, in the, or there's a lot of complex stuff to do in the game. And um, they didn't want to give you an in-game journal to keep track of it. You just, you know, it's it's old school, man. Get out a notebook and start writing shit down. Which yeah. I can respect as a design decision. I mean, I, you could respect anything that it does as a design decision. But then you have somebody that says, boy, I'd really like it if it had, you know, a, a quest log. And they just, everybody just hates. If you don't like it, then, you know, don't play it. Which, that's not how criticism works. <laughs> I tried I tried the new Dodge minivan and it kept stalling every half mile. Well, if you don't like it, then why did you buy it? Get some other car, loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although, I mean, like, that is what people are signing up for at this point, right? Like, at the beginning, when it was true. just Dark Souls or whatever it was. Demon Souls, I guess, was the first one. Right. Although this is a new layer of complexity to have all these like this is a this is a new thing that the game is denying players. <laughs> okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, it used to be you had like four or five trails that you could follow or whatever, and now it's like it's an open world game. There's a little fractal of, of options. Right. And even that would be fine, but you know there there's one guy telling you, if you don't like it, don't play it. And there's somebody else saying, you're not allowed to, you know, you just, you have to play it. 
And if you don't play it, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's the best game ever. And don't worry about any of the things that you don't like because that's where you're wrong. Oh, and you know, you, you can deal with either one of those people, but being trapped between them and the fact that they don't seem to be aware of each other. <laughs> like, if you could hook them right. up to each other and get them to fight, that would be great. You, they could just fight with each other forever and I could go off and do my own thing. But no, they, you know, they, they each give you their, their opposing arguments, but they have to go through you to have it. You must try this game. You must not try this game. I feel like it's more like the guy who kneels down behind you and the other guy who comes up and pushes you over, right? It's just, they're right. working together, but not in a way that you appreciate. I mean, I am glad. It is the highest rated game on uh, Open Critic right now. So, like, that's pretty impressive. That is pretty There's impressive. Definitely, it's definitely um, doing something for a lot of people that are clearly underserved by the games we're getting these days. Either that like, or it has an extremely loyal fan base that is willing to dedicate their lives and everyone else's in order to boost the ratings. Like, why hasn't anybody tried... Given how loyal these folks are, why isn't everybody anybody trying to muscle in on this? Why is everybody trying to copy Ubisoft? Like, Ubisoft just <laughs> oh, has, no. like, four franchises that are all the same thing with a different skin on it. It's like, run around that open world and chase map markers. And, you know, all the other publishers have one of those, too. And then here's this beloved series with this diehard fan base. And no, nobody wants in on that action? You're just going to, like, make another open-world shooter? Well, I mean, to be fair, it does also have a huge number of people who are like, this is terrible and I hate it, and why do you keep making these games? I don't mind that they keep making the games. I mean, it's obvious there's a... I mean, that's that's the reason they make them. There's there's a big audience for them. It would be like mm. the, the industry would be poorer if they stopped making them. I just wish uh, people would try stop trying to get me to play them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, man. I, mean, I watched me, uh, you're, Jonathan you're, Blow's... Hmm? Oh, I was just going to say, like, the... You know what? Let's, let's just jump to Jonathan Blow. I want to hear about that. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, he, he did a stream and then uh, the uh, Jonathan Blow's repost fan, an unofficial thing on YouTube. I forget what the name of the, the thing is now, but he put up like a highlights reel of John playing Elden Ring. And he's not a fan of Souls games to begin with. And so he's like, I'm going to try this out. I'm probably not going to like it, but I'm prepared to like it if there's something in it for me. And I, I think he's in uh, in a similar camp to you and I where it's like, I don't want to be punished for learning things. I don't want to have to do a corpse run every time I make a mistake. Uh, I, I'd really like it if the game was less janky for how precise it expects me to be with my controls, uh, yeah. that kind of thing. And, and now with the journal thing, like, oh, I guess I'm supposed to take notes. And you've, like, having that level of complexity without a journal to guide you kind of puts another restraint on how you play, play. That's kind of pushing, that's kind of a game designed for people that binge their way through games. This is not a game that you're supposed to play for a couple of hours every Saturday. Yeah, yeah, you got to have it all in your head all at once. Right. You, you know, if you just play on Saturday afternoons when the rest of your family is out doing something else, and that's the only time you have quiet to play video games, then you're going to have a hard time in Elden Ring. Like, you come back a week later and you'll be like, I have no idea what I was doing. Yeah, it's like playing Civilization and, you know, like, there's no, there's no quest log in there either. That's a game that really I can quest log. Right? What was I doing? Oh, yeah, I was conquering Russia in winter. And how was that going? Oh, yeah, that was going badly. <laughs> well, like, it used to be in the old games, now they've fixed this to a certain degree, but it used to be in the old games, like, you couldn't issue multi-turn move orders. You'd be like, I move this thing over here. And then, like, you come back two turns later and you're like, where was this thing going? And what's on it? And why, oh, right. why is it here? And then... Or you've got like a diplomat somewhere in the middle of nowhere and he's like, I was going to send him to somewhere to do something that one of these factions, or maybe he's going to convert a barbarian camp. I, why, why is this barbarian out in the middle of nowhere? Right. Although now that you can I issue multi-turn orders, so you like right click halfway across the map 
you know, you're in the middle of a war and you yeah. tell this guy, yeah. oh, go over here. And then, like, you know, the war ends and, like, ten turns later, the guy shows <laughs> up and it's suddenly like, all right, what's my next move, boss? And you're like, who are you? What are you doing on the other side of the world? <laughs> Right. You're you're going along, you know, sign the peace treaty, everything's great, and then it's like, you violated our borders. It's war. You're like, no. Well, it's just like I, I love the feeling of, you know, twenty turns later I'm like building aircraft carriers and and, and suddenly my Viking <laughs> longboat arrives at this other coast <laughs> to continue this war I've been done with for hours. Like, oh uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is kind of a weird thing with with Elden Ring how like they're they're holding on to so many of the elements of the game. This is a, a comment that Jonathan Blow made. It's not original to me, but that it seems like they're afraid to change anything because they're not sure what it is that people like about their game. So they just like right. don't change anything. I I would you know what I'd be the same way. I mean, if I was in charge of making one of these and for some reason I wasn't making a game that I want to play, instead I was in charge of making a Dark Souls game, <laughs> I wouldn't want to change anything either because it's like, I'm not totally sure what makes this formula work for the people who love it. Like, people say, oh no, it's not about the punishment, it's not about the punishment, but, you know, oh, that's not what makes it great, and I don't, you know, that's just part of, but like, I think if the game stopped being punishing, it stopped being so cruel, a lot of people would like it less. They would feel it was patronizing and dumbed down. Are the Soulsborne games just games for trolls and they're trolling themselves? I don't know. This is this is what I've tried to understand. Every time I try to understand it and I'm like, oh, you like the game because this, the answer is no, you're an idiot. That's not why I like it. I like it for other reasons. I like it see, for see? atmosphere. They're yeah. trolling you about the game. That's why they <laughs> like it. I like it for the feeling and the aesthetic and the gameplay. And it's like, no, but we, no I want to get, you know, can we get more specific there? <laughs> and, and when you try and nail anything down, no, you're wrong. That's not it. That's not it. But I strongly suspect that the cruelty of the game is a necessary component it certainly has a unique flavor that as you say no one seems to be interested in emulating right nobody nobody well some indies you know like there's there was a a 2d game that was very soulsy and in, in its design but like mm. you know 3d souls like games just don't happen Nobody's trying to do that. Oh, y you know what? Uh, I guess Returnal was maybe kind of a little bit visiting that space. Hmm. Returnal is the one where you play as this astronaut and she crashes on a planet and gets stuck in a time loop. But no, it's not a time loop. No, the game explicitly makes it clear that you are dying over and over again and like... Like, you'll see your old dead bodies. It's not that, you know, time is rewinding. It's that hmm. you are stuck in a loop while the rest of the world rolls on. Uh, I watched a whole spoiler breakdown of the game, and it was actually really great. But it was also a game I should never, ever play. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, you know, I saw the first few levels, and I was like, that doesn't look that bad. I could, I could probably play that. And then I saw like the f the the late game bosses, and just how brutal. Just this wall of uh, it's a sci-fi game. You know, you're an astronaut. You know, jumping around, shooting your space gun at stuff, and this wall of particles coming at you that are you know space bullets or whatever from these monsters, and just the margin for error is so slight and the punishment for flubbing the timing is so brutal so brutal and the the punishment for death is heinous i mean it's really i mean it's a, it's a it's not just a souls born game it's a roguelike so you oh. can lose hours of progress it's a soul it's a roguelike but your all of your attempts are part of the same story. 
Hmm. Right. Like when you die in what was the one the game the 2D game that simulated all the wands and blasting through stuff? Noita. Noita. Like in Noita, like when you die and you start a new game, you just assume this is you know, starting the story over. Yeah. Occasionally there'll be a ghost of your previous character that's got like one of your wands or something, but it's not like it's the same world. It regenerates everything. Right. And Returnal is a bit different in that the constant death loop is part of the story. And it's a really mm. good story. I really liked it, but I spoiled the whole thing for myself and I don't even regret it. I... I like really enjoyed this like hour long analysis of the story and no regrets for not playing it. I would, I would not have the, the fortitude to make it through. I would just get too frustrated. All right. Well, what do you say we do some mailbags? Yes, let's. Dear Diecast, I hope this mail finds you both hale and hearty. Huh? Hale and hearty. This, that sounds like you're getting greedy. It sounds like we're some kind of soup. <laughs> Continuing my old man spree, I dug up some games that I used to play a lot on Windows 3.1, e.g. Hocus Pocus. I've never heard of Hocus Pocus, ever. Nor I. I was struck by how different they look in color. Maybe this is just the rose-tinted glasses of nostalgia talking, but when I used to play them on my old black-and-white monitor, they looked far more striking. Do you guys think games looked better in black-and-white compared to in color? How do you feel about games with dedicated black and white modes like L.A. Noir and Tushima? Am I just being an old curmudgeon yelling at clouds? Veil Tim. Uh, it depends on what era you're talking about. Um, the old CGA graphics were eye searing. And I used to play a lot of games that were stuck in CGA mode. And yeah, black and white is vastly superior to CGA. For those that don't remember, CGA is four color mode. So you only get four colors and those four colors are fixed. There's uh. like, yeah, it's like pure searing white, bright purple, blue, and yellow. That's one. And then there's another palette. It's four si similarly really contrasty colors. I think there's yeah. pure white, like hot pink, cyan, and I forget what the other color is. And so it was all like the the four colors are similar intensity. So it's very hard. Oh, the the fourth color was black, of course. What am I thinking? Mm. So then the idea is that you could do something like with a newspaper where you could dither them together to get all the colors in the rainbow just by using <laughs> these four colors and like mixing them with a bunch of dots on the screen, except that the entire screen was like 320 by 240. Right, but they didn't have one that just had red, green, and blue. It was always like a weird slice of the color spectrum so that you couldn't do that. It was the weirdest. It always felt like, who chose these colors? Were they insane? <laughs> it's probably they, a programmer. You know, this is programmer right. art on the graphics level. Right. And the, the fact that all three colors were the same intensity really hurt the visual. Oh, yeah. Because it's like everything is maximum bright or off. So, you know, if if you just... And the, the cards could do it. They could give you three shades of blue, and then you could just, you know, it would be a graded blue image, and that, that would be fine. But no, you couldn't do that in CGA. EGA was, wasn't was as bad, but it was similar. You only had 16 colors to work with. You had a fixed list of 16 colors to work with in EGA. So it was better, but it still wasn't there. And yeah, I think looking back, black and white looks better than a lot of those. It wasn't until we got to Twitter. Sure, well, because with black and white, you could have, what, four bits of black and white? That's like eight shades? Yeah. And that's a that's really that gets you most of the way to a photograph. That you can really go a long way with just eight shades of gray. Like it's amazing mm -hmm. how good a photograph can look. You know, just take a any photograph, turn it into black and white, and reduce it to eight colors. You know, in a program, and the result is not bad. 
the result is vastly superior to what happens if you change it to all white, black, <laughs> cyan, CGA and hot palette. pink. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm looking here at it, at the, the four different, I don't know if there were only four, but yeah. Yeah, and one of them's like cyan, bright, magenta, and white, and then another one is just like a bit darker cyan, magenta, and white. So it's like, what's right. the difference there? Right, and that's cyan, magenta, and white. Um was the most common one i'm i don't remember why i i think that was the only one like there was another mode that like maybe it didn't have blue and you really want to have blue yeah well the other one is, looks like it's green brown and yellow right and it's like oh if i've got sky then what do i use for the sky or water <laughs> like <laughs> You know, you're, you you really need a mode with blue. But and you notice there's none of them have just red, green, and blue, which would do a right. lot. Oh, man. So maybe that's what he's thinking of is the CGA graphics. I assume Except so. Except he says that and... it, look, it looked better. So so is this like, you know, playing a game? It, Hocus Pocus doesn't look like it's stuck in CGA, though. Really? I don't know Hocus Pocus. It's, yeah, it's you know, uh, maybe 16-bit color or something. It's... Oh, it's nice. Maybe this is a remaster. Who knows? Yeah, screenshots these days, it could be like somebody's remaster somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Um, I just Googled and oh, yeah, that looks almost like 256 color mode. Oh, my gosh. That's mm. ugly as hell, though. My it doesn't goodness. look good, does it? No, that's yeah. really bad. So I think I think it comes back to the same thing as the black and white, right? Is that once you start adding color, there are a lot more ways you can go wrong with black and white yeah. and shades of gray you're just dealing with value and so you can't get clashes you can't get odd contrasts you can't uh get you know in, in proper messaging or, or coding or anything like that it's just like you know it is a, a very clean set of options and you can't really make a bad choice you could make like a horrible checkerboard pattern or something but it, it's not like you're going to be like oh this looks good and it actually doesn't look good at all Right, this Hocus Pocus screenshot I'm looking at has weird, like, some things are made of smooth gradients and other things are very busy, like they're trying to make, like, I don't want to say pho photographic, but it's got too much, to, you know, too much variation in detail. Oh, wow, this yeah. tile is incredibly busy and dense with detail. And then way over here, there's, like, nothing going on. It's just a flat color. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's oh, bad. Oh, man. It's bad. Yeah. So, uh, you weren't wrong about, about Hocus Pocus anyway, Tim. Yeah. I would want to play that game in black and white, or preferably not at all. <laughs> play in black and white mode. Play it on a Hercules monitor while wearing sunglasses. Outdoors. In the summertime. The less <laughs> I can see the screen, the better. Actually, forget the blackjack. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's just go outside. Wow. Coming from you, that's saying a lot. Right? All right. Dear Diecast, two new and popular TV shows ended fairly recently, The Book of Boba Fett and Peacemaker. Have you seen them? And if so, what are your thoughts? Best regards, Bobby T. Thank you, Bobby. Um, Book of Boba Fett, I think, was a hot mess. They didn't know what they were doing with it. it was, it's supposedly the story of Boba Fett. But they just went and did stories about Luke Skywalker and the Mandalorian and like, I, I skipped through it. It was very boring. It didn't fit with the original movies. Like, what does these days? Right. Boba Fett was originally pretty narrow and did not strike me as being an old guy. And now he's a barrel chested 60 year old man. And so, okay, that's that's a little... And this is... Suppo I don't like the idea that... I mean, the book of Boba Fett's... The first chapter is Boba Fett getting knocked into the Sarlacc at the end of Return of the Jedi and then clawing his way back out. And I didn't like that. Man, did you read the original collection of short stories? I think it was called, like, Tales from the, the Moss Eisley Cantina or whatever. I did not. Where like there's Boba Fett and he escapes the Sarlacc pit is like one of the one of the stories in there. And there's a bunch of them. I mean, I wouldn't read anything Star Wars. That just sounds like a bad, just a bad decision. Uh oh, 
we're getting into dangerous territory here. Uh, Seamus right. has clearly never heard of the Zahn novels, so everybody put your pitchforks down and uh, just calm down, everybody. Oh, right, there were all those novels. I, I actually forgot the novels exist. Existed. Yeah, and I pitchforks remember... Down. Yeah. Pitchforks down! Pitchforks yeah. down! Yeah. Um, but it just <laughs> sounds like a... You know, okay, if I were to pitch this idea, hey, George Lucas wrote a book. Like, that sound, I know he didn't write the books. They, they were written by g ghost authors, and G George Lucas's contribution was like, yeah, whatever, fine. Yeah, sure, put my name on the cover and give me, give me a cut of the, the, the uh, Well, the yeah, they were mostly adaptations of the scripts for the originals. Right, but, like, Lucas's strength is not his right, like, that's his weakest thing, is his writing. And his strongest <laughs> thing is his visual design and, and like all of his skills as a filmmaker and not as a writer. So focusing on the writing side of Star Wars sounds like a bad idea. But of course, yeah, if you if you give the property to other authors, they can do things with it. Yeah. Back when I was in high school, I uh, was part of a group of friends who had nothing better to do than read Star Wars novels and write fan fiction in a collaborative forum. So that's what I did for like several years when I was in my teens. Man. Uh, to answer the other half of the question, I really liked Peacemaker. Um, hmm. Peacemaker, the, the, okay, there's Suicide Squad came out like six years ago and it sucked. It was just a terrible disaster of a movie. And then last year they came out with The Suicide Squad, which was the same premise of a movie and many of the same actors but was basically like sort of a reboot but not quite not directed by the same guy or something what what did they change right. oh very much this was written um by james gunn who did such a great job with the guardians of the galaxy movies oh yeah and it was really good it, it was i really liked the Suicide Squad, the latest one. It was a really good movie. It was maybe a bit too much movie, but I really liked it. So then Peacemaker is a character from the Suicide Squad, I take it? Yes. Peacemaker is played by John Cena. Uh uh, he's a wrestler. He's like the most famous wrestler. Isn't but isn't John Cena his stage name? I believe it's also his real name. I think he's one of those guys that goes by his real name. Wow. Okay. Hang on, let's look it up. <laughs> John Felix Anthony Cena is an American professional wrestler, actor, and former rapper? What? Currently signed to <laughs> WWE, so he's still a wrestler. He was also born in 77, so he's only a little bit younger than me. He's in his 40s. He's widely regarded as one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time. Um, he's tied for the most world championship reigns in professional wrestling hi history. Okay, this is such a weird thing about wrestling. Who wins the most? That's like saying Superman has the record for the most fights won in comic books. That's just such a weird thing. <laughs> Against <to keep> Kryptonians. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, anyway. John Cena um, plays Peacemaker, and Peacemaker is like everybody in the Suicide Squad, a villain, but kind of like a, or an anti-hero. Like, um, he's, he, you know, he likes to, um, he, he has kind of this patriot motif, but he's very confused about what that means. And he's hmm. like, I love peace, and I'm willing to fight for peace, and I don't care how many men, men, women, and children I have to kill to get it. Like that sort of level of confusion, and and everybody, right. I mean, it's, this character is kind of a joke. I guess maybe all the characters right. are kind of a joke, and they squad. are all a joke, um, except for like Bloodshot or whatever his name is. Idris Elba's character is more serious than everybody else. But yeah, uh, Peacemaker is just this awful doofus who thinks he's being heroic, but it's just awful, and um. He, get, he got his own series, and I really liked it. I was like, what could you do with such an awful character? But they actually, James Gunn came up with a lot of interesting things to do with him. Huh. 
Um, I really enjoyed it. It is pretty friggin' dark. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, that make that checks out. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like, uh, like he's got a buddy, Vigilante, and they they. It hints that they used to go out and all the time, and they see themselves as superheroes fighting crime. And they talk about all oh, the old days when we used to go out and fight bad guys. But then they would mention, like, killing people for vandalism. And you're like, <laughs> oh, no. I don't think you guys are superheroes. I think you're just murderers. <laughs> Minimum necessary force. Minimum necessary. Right. I really liked I really liked Peacemaker and I really hated Book of Boba Fett. That's my take on those two properties. Hmm. But would it have been better if they had brought the Peacemaker into the Book of Boba Fett? Um, well they couldn't have made it worse. <laughs> Ooh, wow, okay. Next question. I, you know Oh, you know what? Boba Fett versus Peacemaker. That would be a fun battle. <laughs> but does the Peacemaker have a meeting appointment? Dear Die Castles, the practice of safe scumming is pervasive in video games and is a problem for any game designer whose game has a safe system. What measures do you think that designers should take to deter players from abusing the system? Can you think of any examples of games that you've played where you were tempted to reload after dealing with some adversity, but you avoided doing so and why? Or do you think that safe scumming is an acceptable practice and not worth worrying about from a designer perspective? Curious about your thoughts either way. Regards, Zeta Kai. Um, safe scumming is a problem only if the player feels obligated to do it and then ruins it ruins the game for them. Uh, a save, mm -hmm. Okay, something that would encourage me to save scum is, oh, here's a, here's a treasure chest. It will randomly have either the best sword in the game or, you know, a brick. And it's just <laughs> a, random. A game-ending encounter, boss. Right. right. It's like when you make chests... Uh, when you make chests finite and their loot random, the player feels obligated to get the best outcome possible from the chests. Right. And at that point, why don't you just let them select what outcome they want and just avoid the hassle? Right. Um, you can you can help this by, you know, not making chests finite. If they can run a dungeon more than once, that helps. If the contents of the chest are rolled when they enter the dungeon, so you'd have to play the entire dungeon over again. But even that, that would just mm. make the player really bitter when they get to the end and they get a brick <laughs> or they get something stupid. They're going to be like, oh, right. I went through this whole thing hoping for the good thing, and then I got this loot that's worthless to me. So you definitely you have to be very so careful. Excess randomness about... is what you're saying. If there's too much yeah. randomness in the game, then players are going to be incentivized to save scum because the randomness overwhelms the skill that they're inputting. That's a good way of... of saying it yeah the the randomness shouldn't be too noisy you shouldn't have some loot that's like a thousand times better than other loot unless you're doing some sort of borderlands thing but borderlands borderlands suffers from no save scumming and it's <laughs> you know you just you play it and you i mean that that's the perfect solution is there's no save scumming in borderlands and there'd be no reason to do so i could Yes, I didn't like what I got when I opened up this red chest. I could dump out of the game, restart it, open up the red chest again. Or, in the time it would take me to do that, I could have just walked to the next chest. Mm, right, right. So, make the cost low enough. If you want to have a ton of randomness, then make the cost for rolling, the, pulling the lever or whatever low enough that people just pull the lever instead of you know, quitting out and retrying. Right. Um. Well, and Borderlands, when it saves the game, it saves you at like, it saves continuously. But when you reload it, you appear at these. You always appear outside of the camp or the dungeon or whatever that you're attacking. Mm, okay, it's kind of a checkpoint kind of system. Right. So you'd you'd still you have a bit of a run. You can't just save right there, standing in front of the red chest. 
and then reload the game and still be standing in front of the red chest. You have a hike ahead of you, and of course all the monsters respawn. So if you reload the game, yeah, you're going to have several minutes of gameplay before you can get back to that chest. And in that time, you'd, you'd make it to the next one or get close to it. And so you might as well keep the experience points that you got and just keep going forward. And, uh, yeah, just keep pulling the lever on that slot machine because there's, you can just keep pulling it forever. You, there's not a fixed number of them. <laughs> right. Murder all you want. We'll make more. So, uh, I guess if you, if you don't have an infinite content, a way to generate infinite content, then you need to make the random number generation, not overwhelm the game. And if you want to have tons of randomness, then you should have a way for to generate a bunch of content so people can keep interacting with that system until they get the outcome they want. Right. And it's not even about the value of the loot. I mean, imagine if, um, oh, this chest will always give you a tier three weapon. But like, oh man, I really need, you know, I've decided to be an archer this game and I get to the end of the dungeon and it gives me, a, a you know, a tier three tower shield and it's like well that doesn't do me any good <laughs> <laughs> right i guess a crafting system could be a way to to avoid that too like you know if yeah. all the outcomes are are transmutable into other outcomes at some exchange rate right you could tear it apart and get some of the mithril that we used to make the tower shield and use it to make your mithril bow or whatever um that that would also help that that's a nice way to turn unwanted loot into like more loot at, at, like you said, an exchange rate. I feel the other way to do it is to just lean into the save scumming and have like something like a save state system, in, like in the old emulators, where you could just like at any time, like lock in the state right. of every variable of the game and then go right back to that moment, you know, with the push of a button almost instantly so that you can just like keep running that one thing. Because then what, what you're basically doing is allowing the player to, to, fine-tune their route through that thing, you know, exactly how they want it. Another another solution that game developers have been using lately is you can just make your loading times god-awful, and then nobody <laughs> will want to reload the game. And it's just like, That's a solution. Uh, oh, okay. Just feature it. Right. Oh, this game has eternal loading screens. Absolutely agonizing loading screens. You will not want to to save scum at all because you'll just be there all day oh boy holy cow have we done a show already maybe what qualifies about an hour okay can we can we rerun the show to get the a better outcome oh no all right well thanks to everybody who sent in these great questions and we finally got some questions answered this week look at that we got th oh three you know it felt like we answered more than that <laughs> Every week we say, oh, we're going to get through our topics quick, and then we'll just answer a ton of mailbags. And then we don't, and then we fail again. All right, well, thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Yes, contribute to our failure by sending in more questions. 